This is Pulped Coffee, and this is Orange Juice. Let me back up. Welcome back. This is the second video in a short series about specific types of coffee processing. This series details each process that I learned about during a week-long fermentation training camp with coffee processing specialist Lucia Solis. I'm Roaster Cat, and I attended Lucia's workshop in January of 2023, so this is a recap of what I learned. In this video, you will see two versions of a citric processed coffee one utilizing that citrus juice you saw in the first clip, and the other using a solution of citric acid powder dissolved in water. If you missed the first video with the yeast inoculation, now would be a good time to pause this video and go watch that one. The intro in that video is more extensive and shows the pulping process, as well as describing some key pieces of equipment. I'll give a quicker run through in this video just to get you up to speed, but the yeast video really lays a good foundation, so I recommend watching that first. But without further ado, if you're ready to move on, let's get started. So we received the coffee and immediately submerged it in cold water. This cools the cherries down to halt any fermentation that may have started between when the cherries were picked and when they came to us. This step also allows us to float the coffee, which literally means we removed any coffee cherries that float on the water. Higher density beans sink, which is an indication that they're ripe and ready to be processed. But cherries with defective seeds, insect damage, or unripe cherries will float. Generally speaking, these coffees reduce the quality of our overall batch, so we want to remove them. After cooling and floating, we put the coffee cherries out on raised beds in the shade and sorted out anything we don't want, like obviously green unripe cherries. And we took some initial measurements. Again, if you haven't watched the yeast video, now is a good time. I described the maturity table and the bricks measurements in more depth on that video. So we sorted the coffee for a while, spread it out thin on these raised beds, and left it overnight until we were ready for the next step. Since this will be a washed coffee, the next step was to pulp the coffee or remove the skin from the seeds. This small machine, called a depulper, pinches the coffee cherries and removes the seeds, what we call coffee beans. There's a thin, sticky layer of fruit sugar, called mucilage, left on the seed at this point. Some producers will leave that mucilage on, which would make a honey-processed coffee, but since we're doing a washed coffee, we want to remove that mucilage. There are machines called demucilaginators, say that 10 times fast, that can accomplish this, but they're often large, expensive, and use a lot of energy and or water. So. That is where this citric process comes in. The purpose of the citric process is to use citric acid to break down the sticky mucilage as quickly as possible. Even though it's called citric process and we are using literal citrus juice or citric acid, the goal was not to impart a citric flavor onto the coffees. In fact, our goal was to get the clearest, most naked view of the coffee possible. So this is what I use to get just like Varietal differences, yeah. like a naked view of without a processing input. Just like, what am I starting with? And then, how would I tweak this varietal in which direction? So, this is just like a really quick, you can also do this with a mechanical juice sweat. It removes it mechanically, you try to have no fermentation, but if you don't want to buy the machine, install the machine, there's lemons, remove the juice really quickly, and you get some view of what am I, what, what's my coffee like. And maybe this is it. tastes good. Yeah. Maybe you can just process your coffee in 30 minutes with a couple of lime trees. Yeah. <laughs> fermentation and wait. In the yeast inoculation process, the coffee fermented for 46 hours before all the mucilage could wash off easily. In that time, flavors can change a bit, and the yeast does have some effect on homogenizing the flavor of the coffee. In the citric process, we went from the pulper to the drying beds in 30 minutes. According to Lucia, that's hardly enough time for the citric acid to penetrate the parchment and significantly impact the flavor of the coffee. Hey Lucia, about how long does it take for something to actually impact the flavor of the coffee? At least 12 hours to be able to like penetrate that process that I've been seeing to like a minimum contact of 12 hours. Uh, temperature, pressure could also influence 
but I really haven't seen that one. Really. Like, yeah, oh my 12 hours is a pretty good standard. It is important to note that there are some producers, especially in Colombia, who are doing what's called co-fermentation, where they add fruit, fruit juice, or other products to the coffee's fermentation in order to impart flavors onto the coffee. This is usually done for 36, 48, or more hours, and is an emerging innovation in coffee processing and changing coffee's flavor at the farm level. I've had lemon, strawberry, mango, grape, even passion fruit co-fermented coffees. I've even tried some coffees with mint and eucalyptus added during the fermentation. Some of these coffees are remarkable and others are not my favorite. In any case, this citric process that we're doing is not that. This is not co-fermentation. We aren't trying to add flavor. 30 minutes is not really long enough to do that. We were just trying to remove the mucilage quickly. Okay, back to the processing. As I mentioned, we did two citric processed nano lots, one with juice from the limon mandarina, which is a very popular fruit in this region of Colombia. In fact, this juice came from the tree in Lucia's backyard, so it's an inexpensive and readily available resource for farmers wanting to do something like this. For the other nano citric lot, we dissolved citric acid in water until it reached the pH or acidity that matched that of the lime juice. Once we added the citric acid solutions to each batch of the pulped coffee, we spent a little time agitating the beans with our hands. Basically, we just rubbed the coffee in the liquid, encouraging the citric acid to break down that mucilage. We also took Brix measurements, which is a measure of sugar dissolved in a liquid. So both of these buckets started with the same pH, but their Brix measurements were different, which was super interesting to see. But I'll let you see for yourself. Oh, oh, oh wow. wow. I not see it with my eyes. <laughs> cool. <laughs> see. The, the sugar in the juice. Exactly. So even though it has the same pH, mm -hmm. it Yeah, mm -hmm. So the situation is both of these have the same pH. 2.1 and 2.0. Same starting pH, very different bricks. This one is a 7 and this one is a 4. So if we took these fermentations to the end, if we just were going off of pH, we would say that they're, they're the same. But if we take another measurement, which will actually very different, starting with much more concentration here than this one. So it may not mean anything, you would have to wait till you cup it and then say, do I like one versus the other? Or or they taste exactly the same, I can't tell the difference, and it doesn't matter, so it will depend. Within 30 minutes, all that sticky, sugary mucilage had been broken down, and the coffee parchment was ready to be rinsed and dried. At this stage, it's called parchment, and it takes around a week or two for a washed coffee like this to fully dry. Then it can be dry hulled, which means the parchment layer is removed, then it becomes green coffee, ready to be roasted, brewed, and enjoyed. So why would a farmer want to use this citric process? Yeah. Two reasons. Yeah. One, it can give you a compare and contrast, it can control. What does this coffee taste like with no processing? And just like the pure varietal. And then you do a fermentation, and then you say, do I like this coffee better in the fermentation? Do I like it better as a natural compared to kind of like before? And the second one is the option, if you have a lot of coffee coming, and maybe you can't keep up with it and you can't do 100 fermentations for 100 hours and you can do something quick and make sure that you can just have the, the flow. Because maybe you like the coffee. Even though there's very minimal, negligible processes. And that is the citric process. It's a relatively quick process overall. You can receive the coffees, pulp them, and get them out on the drying beds within one day. So it can help a producer really speed up their production, especially if they're running out of fermentation space. Plus it can give a naked or pure view of what a coffee can taste like without additional processing. So let me know what you think in the comments below. How does it compare to the yeast inoculation? To reiterate, this was a descriptive video of what I saw at Lucia's fermentation training camp, not a prescriptive video or step-by-step -step guide of how to do these processes. It's really just meant for context. If you have questions, comments, or ideas, put those in the comments below and I'll do my very best to answer them. Also, Lucia has a podcast called Making Coffee with Lucia Solis. If you want to learn more about coffee processing, I highly recommend that podcast 
also giving her a follow on Instagram and joining her Patreon. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe to this channel for more. I have another video about the lactic process coming up. Make sure you check that yeast inoculation video if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. Cheers.